Half-Life is one of the most beloved game series of all time, and for good reason. Despite the first entry into the franchise coming out last millennium, in my opinion there are still plenty of things from Half-Life that contemporary games could do a better job of taking notes on. For example, nothing kills my immersion in gameplay faster than an obstructive pop-up reminding me that WASD had the keys I need to press in order to move around the game world. Or a cutscene that deletes my player character from existence while something important to the story happens. I guess my player avatar is just sitting off camera, eating popcorn while it all goes down. Generally, it's quite annoying to me when games assume that my level of intelligence is that of a tech illiterate three-year-old, with constant reminders on basic gameplay systems that have already been taught, either from an aforementioned pop-up or something diegetic, like a character telling me how to do something I've been doing the entire game. The Half-Life series are pieces of media that are thankfully free from this ever-infuriating weight. And yes, I say pieces of media and not video games, because this mindset of refusing to believe your audience possesses more than three brain cells is far from exclusive to the video game medium. Many TV shows and movies nowadays are also engineered for the stupid, with achingly familiar methods of reminding audiences what's going on. Characters will remind viewers of things by saying things that they would never, ever realistically say. Almost as if the writers are afraid of their audience members thinking critically about the show. After finishing the final season of a certain recent TV program, going back to normal TV felt like somewhat of a downgrade. No more was I left to ponder what's going on behind characters' minds. No more left to process complicated webs of character relationships. Instead, the spoon-feeding of processed information globules directly into my waiting maw commenced once again. This was a similar feeling to once I realised I'd exhausted all the games in the big fat Valve bundle. A cheap buy from Steam's front page during any major sale. Only after squeezing the available playtime from this bundle dry, did I understand why Half-Life 3 When memes had been so popular in my years on the internet. Only once you reach the end of Half-Life 2 Episode 2, after having played through the entire series, can you understand. Only once you realise the main thing left after that dreadful cliffhanger ending is the never-ending sea of incessant pop-ups and tutorial characters that far too many games rely on today. Can you empathise with the generation of people taunted by the distinctively incomplete trilogy of episodic follow-ups supplementing Half-Life 2? It's a desperate cry for good media. Not just media that satiates and entertains you, media that makes you think. Media that makes those gears within your brain begin to mesh. Now, I'm not here to summarise Half-Life. If you haven't played any of these games, I really have to question your life choices, but I will try to keep this video as spoiler-free as possible. Instead, I want to focus on one specific moment in one of the games that is essentially the epitome of why these games are such giants in the realms of both storytelling and gameplay. Let's begin with the opening to Half-Life 1. As someone who wasn't alive yet when this game came out, I can't really give a 100% truthful recount of how impactful the release of Half-Life 1 actually was, but think of it this way. Unlike probably any other first-person shooter from the 90s that you could name, Half-Life opens in a fairly mundane way. Gordon Freeman's commute to work isn't the most attention-gripping intro out there, but this is done intentionally. Most other FPSs of the time had intros designed to ensnare the attention of their players, much like how YouTubers these days rely on cheap clickbaity phrases for a similar effect. Half-Life's intro notifies the player that the game is a bit more focused on story than your average game from that time period. That being said, I wouldn't call Half-Life story focused. The story is merely there to serve the gameplay and make the world feel more rich, which it does quite successfully. Throughout the game, there's an obvious lack of quests and other storytelling traps which many contemporary games regrettably fall for. Instead, the game's story is dictated through the player via simple and brief dialogues with guard and scientist NPCs. The panicked residents of the Black Mesa facility have no interest in spouting exposition or providing information of questionable necessity to the player. Rather, notifying Gordon of his objective is the purpose of their brief dialogues. Get out of the labs. Find the rocket. Launch the rocket. Restart the generator. Well, so much for the government. Their idea of containment is to kill everyone associated with the project. The surface level of the game's story is all you're directly provided with, and it's enough to keep the player posted on where they're supposed to go, but also not enough information such it would be tiring or hard to remember. This makes the player cling onto every thread of information provided by the surviving NPCs. In a way, you become much like the HECU grunts you slaughter throughout the game, a simple pawn following orders. This succeeds in giving the player plenty of time to focus on the gameplay, 
but it does also leave a lot of lingering questions that'll be pondered in those brief downtime spent walking down corridors or figuring out a puzzle. The lack of direct information about the game's universe makes Half-Life 1 an excellent platform for theory crafting and speculation, especially regarding the alien locations and enemies in the latter chapters of the game. Although a lot of Half-Life 1 is simply shooting baddies, the scraps of story you do receive, alongside your clear objectives, makes the violence feel purposeful. There's a reason for all this bloodshed, and that reason is something other than the bloodshed itself. The greatest thing about this storytelling style is that it's completely possible to ignore, which might seem like a strange compliment to give, but there genuinely is something nice about being able to leave the story alone and just focus on the gameplay. Which, by the way, still managed to absolutely kick my ass. This game demands a lot of you, largely in comparison to Half-Life 2 and Episodes. If you don't utilize your full arsenal, move as much as you can, and generally shoot good, you're gonna get your ass chucked from your HEV suit and handed to you on a platter. The gameplay being as much of a strong point as it is, only serves to support the story side even more. The two work together in perfect tandem, impossible to exist without the other. One side is a morphine-fueled rampage through a collapsing facility. The other, a mystery-fueled tale of man's worst tendencies, multiple levels of government cover-ups, and alien slaves. At least, that's the spoiler-free version. Both the story and the gameplay contribute to Half-Life 1 being quite an immersive experience, at times, it's easy to forget you're simply a person sitting in their chair, playing a video game. It feels a lot more like you're a PhD-wielding, hazard suit-wearing, Tau cannon-toting scientist, tasked with severing the link between two worlds. Twenty chronological and six real-life years later, comes Half-Life 2, the next entry in the series. It's almost hard to believe the gap between these two is only just over half a decade. The difference in all facets is astounding. I could sit here and describe how comparatively pretty the graphics are, but you can probably see that for yourself. The story is another massive jump up from the first game. The thing is, Half-Life 1 didn't really have characters. Aside from Gordon himself, who is of course completely silent, and I guess tutorial lady, Oh, get off. Don't I got this. The game's story is only populated by nameless, faceless guards and scientists. This makes Half-Life 2's ability to contextualize events from the first game all the more impressive. Most of the characters you meet will reference their time at Black Mesa with Gordon, time spent either competing for grant money or escaping the horrific events that took place after the Resonance Cascade. The opening sequence in Half-Life 2 is nothing short of a masterclass in indirect storytelling. It's been 20 chronological years since the ending to the first game, and suffice to say, the world has changed significantly. Just by walking throughout the train station, players can comfortably infer what's happened to humanity and Earth in the past two decades. Well, end of the line. Overwatch stopped our train in the woods and took my husband for questioning. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to join civil protection just to get a decent meal. I see they took your suitcase too. They can't get away with this much longer. Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. I don't even remember how I got here. What's the best way to teach something to a player of your game? One of Half-Life 2's selling features is a fully functioning physics engine. Not merely present to give more life to the mice on scene of the world, but to really add an extra dimension to the gameplay, present in such forms as puzzles and the iconic gravity gun, a contender for the most enjoyable weapon to use in any video game ever. But to players when this game came out, this sort of thing was totally unprecedented. Remember, just six short years ago, games still looked like this, and procedural physics of any kind was just the stuff of dreams. So the way Half-Life 2 informs its players of physics is through this genius little interaction. Of course, simulated physics are an intuitive thing to dwellers of planets that have gravity. So all it takes to educate this is one quick little exchange. Small, short set pieces like these is what makes Half-Life 2 storytelling thrive. The game is absolutely chock full of them, each often accentuated by the game's excellently fitting soundtrack or some dialogue.
There's also a decent amount of less show-off-y micro-occurrences in the game like this one. Take, for example, the endless amounts of abandoned houses one can encounter, particularly during the Highway 17 chapter. Each one of them tells its own little story, full of details that indicate who the residents were and what their fates may ultimately have been. Personally, I find it quite easy to lose a lot of time just thinking about the past residents of the many disheveled hovels you can find along the depressing coastal sections of the game. All of the tiny little stories contained within the game's maps are part of what makes the overarching story and world feel so rich and alive. You can really feel the impact that the Combine has had on planet Earth and its inhabitants, and that's only before you consider the countless other conquered stellar systems under their belt. That's not to say these small, less important set pieces are a key part of the story. It's still entirely possible to grab the supplies contained within them and then continue on with the main game, which is a continuation of one of Half-Life 1's biggest strengths. The main story itself does actually have a fair amount of unskippable dialogue sections, which was something that was notably less present in the previous Half-Life, but these won't really interrupt the momentum of the game unless you're on a repeat playthrough. Even so, there are usually plenty of things to mess around with in the story-heavy areas if you don't want to listen, like the mini-teleporter in Kleiner's lab. Compared to other games out there, this way of delivering key story information to the player is much more digestible than jankily wrenching control of the game from the player's hands and forcing them to watch a poorly animated cutscene. Not only does Half-Life 2's dialogue feature detailed facial animation, but the characters also walk around, animate expressively with their arms, and talk to the player all at the same time. This creates the convincing illusion of actually being present in the room with the characters, much like a real-life conversation. Aside from Gordon's lack of participants, obviously. Man, a few words, aren't you? An interesting trade-off that Valve's refusal to use cutscenes brings is that it's actually possible for players to miss key information or important plot points. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from just looking away or not paying attention during Half-Life's pseudo cutscenes, and in some rare cases, it's actually possible for a talking NPC to get killed mid-conversation. We were heading for the Vortigon. Obviously meaning the players won't get to hear what they have to say. This is a detail that makes the world feel alive and real, and all the more grisly for it. This is probably the reason why so many games do use cutscenes, instead of naturally implemented dialogue like this. There's a definitive risk of players not seeing the things they need to see. But if you ask me, this is part of why the game's stories are so engaging. It doesn't hold your hand or try to shove things down your throat, even for a second. Yes, you can miss things, but if that happens, it's usually entirely your own fault. Why feel the need to forcefully preach a story to a player when they're clearly not even interested? Directly after the events of Half-Life 2 come two episodic games. These both continue the story whilst introducing more mechanics, making use of the game's physics engine and other systems. Episode 1 involves Gordon and Alex trying to escape City 17 after the ending to Half-Life 2. It has a much darker tone than the other games so far. The music in particular largely comprised of depressing ambient drones, as opposed to the pumping industrial tracks we've become accustomed to. Episode 1 continues to make full use of everything that makes Half-Life games so good. Although some of the scenarios are comparatively dull, mainly the citizen escort segment towards the end of the game, there are still plentiful amounts of new situations. Puzzles, dark segments, collapsing buildings. Although Episode 1 is often considered the weakest of the Half-Life Superfector, Episode 2, the final entry, brings it to a whole new level. Combat is easily the weakest, or most poorly aged, aspect of Half-Life 2. Enemies AI gets repetitive to face off against, in general they're not very smart, and a lot of the combats end up being a bit the same. In a world where running, sliding and vaulting are considered commonplace moves in FPS games, Gordon Freeman can feel like a bit of a snail to players comparatively. The times when combat is unique and enjoyable is usually when the gravity gun is involved. This weapon turns mundane objects from the environment, jerry cans, chunks of concrete, radiators, into deadly projectiles, rocketing at 100 miles per hour towards the nearest zombie's cranium. 
The loop of scanning for things to use as makeshift weapons, aiming, and firing is an eternally exciting one. It gets even better once you realize you can catch enemies throwing grenades or energy balls, or come across a coveted sword blade or explosive barrel. Regrettably, not every combat situation will have any of these items present. Once you realize that flinging traffic cones or cardboard boxes at Combine officers isn't really going to work in your favor, well, maybe it's time to pull out one of those boring old firearms. Throughout the game's supplementary episodes, it seems the game designers were aware of this to some extent. Episode 1 features some new combat mechanics, like blocking off antlion tunnels using cars, or the various dark sections that are cast in pitch black night, even though the game still has some weaker segments like the repetitive citizen escort. Episode 2 is where things get taken to the next level though. Even though this game, currently the final chronological entry in the series, is only about 5 hours long, it's ridiculously chock full of exciting combat scenarios and brilliant story beats. I don't think there's ever a boring moment throughout the whole experience. Every combat utilizes some new way of making fighting enemies more enjoyable. Most of these involve set pieces of some kind, like in earlier Half-Life entries. Small happenstances, delicately crafted and tying, somehow, into the overall story. Throughout the Half-Life series, players will often find the borders surrounding their monitor blurring, the borders between fiction and reality dissolving. Gordon Freeman's silent nature easily permits the player to project themselves onto Gordon as they progress throughout the games. The immersive way the story is presented to the player, no cutscenes and realistic dialogue, only furthers this. One such example of a powerful set piece in Episode 2 is the Antlion standoff. After your best pal Alex Vance gets severely wounded, you must meet up with her inside a clearing in an old mineshaft, once used by the human rebels. After spending some time crawling through the nearby Antlion tunnels, you pop out into one of the sprawling caverns leading to the central shaft area. We got Antlions! You idiot. That's Gordon Freeman. The border guard said he was on the way. After talking briefly with the two rebels defending the space, stocking up on supplies, and getting your bearings, one of the jury-rigged traffic lights dedicated to a tunnel lights up, signaling a mild antlion attack. This sensor will light up if an antlion's coming down this tunnel. More lights mean more antlions. They're coming! One light! Let's move. We have to defend the Vort. It's pretty easy to hold off, with the turrets, Griggs, Sheckley, and the portable arsenal in your back pocket, keeping 20 or so antlions away from Alex in a catatonic state is pretty straightforward. Over here, Sheckley! We got the breach. We'll be okay as long as they stick to one tunnel. But then there's another one. It seems something is continually attracting the antlions, according to the rebels. No offense, Freeman. But things were pretty quiet until you showed up. Swarm at 24! Come on, come on, let's go! I'm coming, I'm coming! Next time, it's a double light. Twice as many bugs. Nothing you can't manage, but still a bit worrying. Should I leave some for you, Griggs? The numbers of bugs begins to climb. They're spread across all the tunnels, then next, they're all clumped up at one. One thing is for sure, the numbers are steadily growing. We got 12. Hit coming at 36. And the breach. And 24. Oh God, it's coming from everywhere. This continues for quite some time, and the aliens are still showing no sign of stopping. Then, all of a sudden... Green lights! We got green lights! Why are there so many? Get ready. Oh god! Get ready! Green lights! This is gonna be bad! Hey! It's the board! Stay me! Yeah! Yeah! I was trying to save you, Shaq! Our delay. Regrettable. We killed many antlions. Yet many more remain. We must attend to the Alexans. We shall quiet them.
At this point, there's simply no question about it. Any perceived borders between you, the player, and our ever-remarkable Dr. Freeman are null. You and dearest Freeman are one, one and the same. It is you who accomplished those commendable things, killing the Nylanth and freeing the slaves. It was you who boarded the Citadel and gave that administrator what he had coming. And at the same time, it was Freeman also. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and all the regular garbage. Let me know your experiences with the Half-Life games and what you thought about this video, as usual. I'm always happy to hear about it. Also, before anyone says anything in the comments, no, I haven't played Alex, and if I see even one of you fuckers <coughs> spoiling it, I will send you to the Shadow Realm. Anyway, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you around.